All right, how many ready for the Word of God? Let me hear you shout amen. 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 Praise God. Let's stand together. I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew chapter number six. I am very excited to share what I have on my heart today. Matthew chapter uh, number six. This is part three of a series that we have entitled Empty Phrases. And we are helping you, amen, with your prayer life and giving you the model that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter number six. My goal is to give you practical principles. Let me ask you, show of hands, how many want your prayer life to go to the next level? Amen. This is how you do it, because I believe in the power of prayer. I believe prayer is changing things. We've got prayer groups that are meeting. Let me just say this real quick. We've got a prayer group every Thursday night that prays over every need that is put in that prayer request box out there. And so if you put a prayer request in there, let me ask you, why don't you do, why don't you do something? Come and meet with this team on a Sunday so that they can pray with you on that particular need. How many believe in the prayer of agreement? Okay, so write it down. They're going to pray over it, but you come and agree with them. I mean, a lot of our team, they want to meet you. They don't know many of the names uh, that are on that list. And so I just encourage you, amen, to do that and come and agree with them. But I want your prayer life to go to a higher level. So this is what we're going to do. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at what Jesus told us. And this is what he said beginning in verse number 9. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Jesus said, in this manner, pray. He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all of God's people shout amen. Amen. Our focus is on verse 11, where Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. All right. So I'm going to get right to it today because we have for the past two weeks talked about, uh, first of all, as we begin to pray, how many believe God is worthy of your worship? Let me hear you shout. Amen. Amen. We begin our time of prayer by saying, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We worship God for who he is. We begin to say, You're our Father, and we magnify you. And I will say the greatest time of your prayer will be time spent worshiping the Lord. You say, You're my Jehovah, my Shama, my Jehovah, Rophe, my. You begin to list all the names of God. How many know worship is powerful? How many have found that to be true? Amen. It enters you into the presence of God. And then last week we said, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. And we prayed about the authority of the kingdom, how we are in the ambassadors of Christ. And we pray for that authority to flow through us. So today we come to a section where Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Now, let me ask you, how many of you in this room have eaten in the last three days? Let me see a show of hands. How many have eaten too much in the last three days? (laughs) Okay, so this is a place where we begin to pray for the provision of God to come into our life. Now, I don't know about you. I am thankful that God provides for me every single day. He provides food, he provides clothing, he provides shelter, he provides finances, he provides a job. And so when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, he's not just talking about food, of course that's part of it, but but he uses bread because bread was so symbolic in the Jewish culture, it was symbolic of God's provision. And even in the Middle East now, when you go over, you're going to see, you know, just everywhere there's in the market carts of bread. Bread is just that bread is a staple in the Middle East, and so it was a staple of their food diet. And so when Jesus said, Give us this day our daily bread, he's showing that the Lord wants you to pray every day for his provision to come into your life. Now, when he said bread, it was indicative of what God provided. Go with me back into the Old Testament, if you will, uh, indicative of what God provided in Exodus 16. 
as the Israelites were traveling through the wilderness, the people began to complain that it was better back in Egypt, and uh, they had great food to eat. And so the Lord did this in verse 4 of Exodus 16. He told Moses, he said, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people will go out, and they will gather a certain rate every day so that I can prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. And so with the next morning when they walked out, God had literally rained this manna out of heaven. I don't know about you, but how many would like to see bread come flying out of heaven for you? Be amazing. So they walk out, and there's this little, you know, wafer-like coriander seed. It was honey-like tasting, so it was a sweet wafer of bread. And the Lord said, I am going to make sure that every day that you walk out of your door, there is going to be manna on the ground for you so that you have enough to eat. And I believe the Lord is saying to us today, God, as your Father, wants to make sure every single day you have enough to sustain sustain you, to provide for you. And I don't know about you, but I am glad I don't have to worry about my provision because I have a heavenly father. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. Listen, and I'm going to say something here that may make somebody mad, but it's okay. I like what Pastor Spencer said. Your provision is not in that green piece of paper. Your provision comes from almighty God. Your boss is not your provider. Your paycheck is not your provider. Your job is not your provider. You have a God in heaven that made a promise to you that every single day, heavenly provision is going to be there for those that will trust in him. You will not lack. Do you believe it? Shout amen. You have to believe that. You have to believe that. And so today, I, I, I want to address this, this, this component of provision because there's a lot of people in this country that are depending on jobs and depending on governments and depending on people to provide for them. You need to shift that faith and realize if you will trust God, you will never go without. Amen. You will never go without. So then why did Jesus then make this as part of our prayer? Well, I want to discuss this with you and go a direction you may not think I'm going to go. Why did he say that you should pray for the provision of God in your life? And again, we've already established it's not just food, but it's that which sustains you. It's that which strengthens you. You come to a point after you've worshiped God, acknowledged him, you prayed for that authority. Now you were saying, Lord, I am praying now for the provision to come into my life to sustain me, and here's why. Number one, I'm going to give you the parameter of God's provision. The parameter of God's provision. When we pray for provision, that provision should center around the assignment that God has for your life. Now, how many believe God has an assignment for your life? Show of hands. He has an assignment for your life. And when you begin to pray for the provision of God, you are praying, amen, that God gives you what you need to complete your assignment that has been given to you by God. Amen. The greatest thing you can do in life is not make a million dollars. It is to please your heavenly father. Now, you can make a million dollars pleasing your heavenly father, but if you focus on the million dollars and you never do the will of God, you will die a pauper. I sucked the air out of the room on that one, didn't I? I don't care how successful you are, I am on my job. If I don't complete the God-given assignment for me, I have failed in life. Because now, again, last week we talked about the will of God. We said that the Bible, God's word, is the general will of God. This applies to everybody. But there is also the specific will of God. In other words, there is a specific assignment that the Lord has given to you from the moment that you were conceived in your mother's womb. Amen. It is the moment that God said, I have a reason for you to be on this earth. Your assignment it is what makes you different than everybody else. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm different than you. I'm different than you. You wives are saying, you sure are. 
Let me count the ways. It is not your gender that makes you different. It is not your race that makes you different. It is not your nationality that makes you different. It is the discovery of your God-given assignment that sets you apart from every other person on the planet. And when you discover that assignment, uh, amen, you will discover the provision that comes with that assignment. Now, I want you to understand this. Jeremiah said, you know this, Jeremiah 1 verse 5, the Lord told Jeremiah that before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. So you don't get to decide your, your assignment. How many know your assignment has already been decided for you by God? It is your job to discover your assignment. And the greatest mission of life is for you to get into the prayer closet and say, God, why have you placed me on this earth? What have you given to me to achieve on this earth? Amen. I don't care what mom and dad say. Mom and dad may want you to be a lawyer. But if God has not created you to be a lawyer, being a lawyer is the worst thing that you could ever do. Because you need to figure out what it is that God has created. Because if you allow other people, listen to me, if you allow other people to determine your assignment, you will forever be hostage to their opinion for the rest of their life. Can I say that again? If other people decide your assignment, you will be forever hostage to their opinion for the rest of their life. You are not created to be a hostage. You are created, amen, to be a free man and woman of God that will do the assignment for which you have been born. Come on, somebody. Give God a shout of praise on that. You will forever, if you allow others to tell you what to do and make decisions for you, if they pull, it's like a chain is around your ankle. If they pull you this way, you've got to go. Or if they pull you this way, you've got to go. I believe the Lord is saying, take off the chain of everybody else's opinion and start walking in the freedom of what I created you to do and to be. That is the most liberating moment you will ever have in your life. Amen. In fact, somebody said the two most important days of your life are the day that you're born and the day you figure out why. And the problem is most people, they go their entire life and they never know why I am here. And today what I'm doing is I'm preaching to you. You are special in the sight of God. And you need to stop living by what everybody else says you can or cannot do. And get into this prayer closet and say, Lord, you have provided an assignment for me. And with that assignment is the bread that is needed, amen, for me to do what I am created to do. Can somebody receive that right now? Amen. So when he says... Give us this day our daily bread. You are praying, amen, every day for God to give you what you need to complete your assignment. Now, because when you live in that assignment, that assignment is the place of your provision. I firmly believe that when we go through a season of lack in our life, it's because we are not living in our assignment. I want you to let that soak in. When we go through a season of lack, it is because we are not living in our God-given assignment. And the reason I say that is because Elijah, I know Pastor Spencer has already looked at my notes and tried to preach my message before I got here. He didn't. That was the Holy Ghost. But Elijah, 1 Samuel 17, the Lord told him this. Look at this in verse number 3. He said, get up, go eastward, go by the brook of Cherith that is before Jordan. That's your assignment. He said, when you get there, you're going to drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now, you know what? I, I don't have biblical 
I don't have biblical proof of this, but historically, some feel those ravens actually were ravens that were owned by the king of Israel, and they were living in the palace. I mean, you remember Ahab and, 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 and Jezebel, how they were trying to kill Elijah? Most historians feel like God took the ravens of Ahab out of the palace, put food in their mouth, and he, they went and they fed the man of God, the very man Ahab was trying to kill. Now, let me, just, <laughs> let me just tell you, I believe the people of God, amen, the wealth of the wicked is laid up and stored up for the righteous. And I believe the people of God, amen, are not going to go without, but rather God is going to take wealth away from the wicked and put it in the mouth of the righteous because this is the hour that the church has got to be strong, well-fed, and we've got the provision of Almighty God, and the Lord can take it out of a millionaire's hands and put it into your hands when you are doing your assignment. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me tell you something. I, I, I believe with all of my heart that we are living in the last days. You see what is going on in Iran, Iraq, and Israel, and the Gaza Strip right now. That is prophetic, and I'm going to do a prophetic series here in a few weeks, but I believe in the last days, the church is going to be stronger than she has ever been, and I believe it's going to take the wealth of the wicked, and God is going to use, amen, the provision of the world, amen, to finance what the kingdom needs to achieve in this world, and I'm telling you, church, you got to have faith to believe it and get up out of that lack and get up out of that poverty mindset and say, Lord, I am believing for your provision so that I can do my assignment. Amen. Does that make sense to anybody today? Shout the word assignment. Shout it again, assignment. I have an assignment. My assignment is to lead you. My assignment is to preach the word every Sunday, every Wednesday, and give you principles uh, so that you can leave these doors uh, and not get lazy, but rather get active uh, for the development and the building of the kingdom of Almighty God. That is my assignment. Your assignment is different than mine. I can't do your assignment. And so therefore, you've got to believe uh, that provision is coming. But then notice with, go, go back to 1 Kings 17 with Elijah. When that assignment was done, the brook dried up. You see, when provision dries up, that means you're not in your assignment. And that means you need to begin to seek the face of God because God is shifting you. God is moving you. Okay, let me say this. Your purpose in life never changes, but your assignment does. And God moves you from assignment to assignment, from place to place, people to people. But every time he does, look, he said, the word of the Lord came and said, get to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Because why? I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. In other words, Elijah, I'm going to put you somewhere and your provision is going to come from somebody that you may think doesn't have it. She's a widow, but yet I'm going to empower her to provide for you so that you can do your assignment. I'm going to know sometimes God uses unexpected people. Do you believe that? Oh God, every day. When you leave your house, you don't know who you are going to meet. And the person you meet could be a person that you might normally walk right by. But the Lord may have arranged a divine appointment for you to talk to that person. And from that person could come your next assignment. Do you hear what I'm saying today? Come on, somebody. Every person you meet is the opportunity for provision from God to flow into your hand. And I believe people are the escorts to our destiny. People are those, amen, which expedite 
the purpose of God to be fulfilled in our life. And so therefore develop the right relationships because God is using people, uh, amen, to complete your assignment. How many get that? Let me hear you shout amen. So when you pray every day, you're saying, Lord, give me this day my daily bread. Give me what I need to complete my assignment. Send the people into my life today to give the provision that I need to complete my assignment. That should be a daily prayer. That should be a daily component of your prayer life. Now, why can we do that? Number two, look at this. Not just the parameters, it should be centered around the assignment God's given to you. But number two, the premise of God's provision. There is a foundation, a platform from which we ask our Heavenly Father for the things of which we have need. And the reason that I need to ask this is because Jesus commanded us to ask for provision. Because I'm dealing with people that right now, amen, you've been grown up in a background where you've been told, you know, you shouldn't ask God for anything. That's being presumptuous. That's being prideful. And I've told you many times, I was raised in that kind of mentality where, you know, the, 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 it was wrong to have money. It was wrong to have provision. It was, you know, the, the poorer you were, the more spiritual you were. But Jesus said this. He said, ask. Everybody say the word ask. Ask and you will receive. He said, seek. Everybody say the word seek. Seek and you will find. He said, knock. Everybody shout the word knock. Knock and it will be opened. If it was wrong to ask God for provision, then why did Jesus command us to do it? It is the desire, listen to me, it is the desire of your heavenly father to make sure that every single area of your life is taken care of and provided for. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, relationally. God wants every area of your life to be provided for. How many can believe that? Shout amen. 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 John said this. He said, beloved, he said, I pray above all things that you may prosper and be in health, uh, even as thy soul prospers. Uh, and today I want you to know, my friend, you can walk away from this place uh, with a level of confidence, knowing your heavenly father, amen, is going to take care of every single area of your life uh, and get the devil out of your head. And that lack of faith that says, I'm going to live in lack. No, from this day forth, you will never again be without. You will have what you need because of your heavenly father. I believe it in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody shout amen. 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 Now you say, well, then why don't I have it? I'm so glad you asked because James said you have not because you ask not. When you ask specifically, you are showing confidence in your heavenly father that not only does he have the ability to give you, he also is willing to give to you what you need. But so many times we don't ask. Listen, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to ask anybody for something I know they don't have. I'm not going to ask a homeless man for a million dollars. Because I know he doesn't have it. And so when you ask your heavenly father for the specifics of what you need, you are expressing confidence in him. And you are saying, God, I know, I know that you not only have it, but you are willing to give it to me. Let me tell you something. You need to begin to ask God specifically for the needs of your life. And don't be ashamed to ask if it fits within your God-given assignment. Do you believe that? Shout amen. I guarantee you don't go to the McDonald's at the counter and that teenage boy is standing across the counter. I guarantee you don't just stand there and expect him to read your mind. That boy doesn't have a clue what you want. You have to ask him. You have to say, I want a Big Mac. I want a large fry. And I want a Diet Coke. Notice I said diet. 
to eliminate the fries and the Big Mac. <laughs> Makes you feel better. It's called false security. <laughs> You, ver you know that. You verbally ask that boy, that, that, that person across the counter. If we do that to somebody that doesn't care about your life, how much more should you ask your heavenly father who has invested everything to save your eternal soul? Listen, you need to start asking him. Do you believe it? Shout amen. amen. He said, seek he said, when you seek. Now, seeking shows what is the priority of your life. How many have ever lost your car keys? Let me show, show of hands. How many have lost them more than once? <laughs> How many have lost your sanctification along with your car keys at the same time? It's in the morning. You've got a 9 o'clock appointment. You can't find your car keys. Amen. What is the number one priority of your life at that moment? Looking for your car keys. I don't care if the baby is puking all over the table. I don't care if your husband is mad because there's no coffee. At that moment, the only thing that matters is you get in your car keys so you can get in your car and get to your meeting. It's a priority. You see, listen, friend, if we would start praying with a desperation, I really believe God would begin to move. But we're so casual in our prayer life. I oh, say, Lord, if you want to heal me, go ahead. You know, whatever your will is. No, you say, Lord, I am seeking after this particular need. I need this in my life. Lord, it's your will. It's according to your word. It fits into my assignment. And I'm not going to stop looking until I get the answer. Listen, when God sees the desperateness of your heart, heart, his hand will move in your life. Do you believe it? Shout amen. amen. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> you may think I'm crazy, but I'm going to tell you something. I am tired, even in my own life, of casual lethargic prayers that don't go anywhere. And I know I was raised in a Pentecostal background. Man, those old women of faith, amen, had their hair piled high. But, man, they'd be at the altar, and they would be praying. They would be weeping. There would be Kleenex boxes at that altar. And they would have their face buried in the altar. And they were seeking God. Amen. And we had moves of the Holy Ghost, and we had moves of the anointing. You know why? Because we were not casual. Amen. We were seeking the face of God. Come on, church. I may lose about 60% of you, but I'm telling you. If we're going to see a move of God, it's when we get serious about seeking the face of God, saying, Lord, I'm not leaving until you touch me. I'm not leaving until I feel the anointing. I'm not leaving until I know that I've got the answer that I need. And when you get serious about seeking God, God is going to get serious about blessing his people. Hallelujah. My God. I'm going to be like Jacob, wrestling all night. And it was Jesus that he was wrestling with. When the Lord was ready to leave in the morning, Jacob said, No, I will not leave unless you touch me. Church, we're living in a day right now when it's like two minutes and we're done. Two minutes and we're done. God bless me, God bless my wife, God bless my kids, but God bless my job, God bless this, God bless my toast, amen, and we're done. What about staying in the presence of God? What about seeking the face of God? What about getting a hold of God? What about staying until the presence of God touches you? What about praying until the Holy Ghost comes into the room? What about praying until you feel something begin to boil up within the soul of your belly and you know that you have touched? Oh, oh come on, church. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm desperate for a move of God. I'm desperate for America to see a move of God. But it's not, oh God. It's going to come when we pray. May the 2nd, Thursday, May the 2nd. It's a national day of prayer. We are moving 
our midweek gathering from Wednesday to Thursday so that we can come and that we can pray and get in the presence of God so that we can see God move in America again. Do you believe it? Shout amen. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm just going to say it. Big men's conference last week. Probably some of you saw it. Big men's conference. Opening act was a guy taking his shirt off, climbing a pole, and swallowing a sword. It was an Assemblies of God men's conference. I was raised Assemblies of God. I tell you what, it turned my stomach to see how far we have fallen. Here's thousands of men there to be fed by the word of God and you get a guy climbing a pole without a shirt, swallowing a sword and we call that God? I'm telling you, that is not God. That is of the world. And God is not going to move by us entertaining. God is going to move when we get serious about seeking his face. Somebody shout amen. Glory to God. I'm already in trouble. Might as well say it. Mark Driscoll called it out, called it the spirit of Jezebel. And then he apologized later. Let me tell you something. He was right. He was right. And I believe we've got to begin to seek the face of God again. Somebody shout amen. Because when you do, you will find what you look for. You will find what you look for. God's not hard to find. He's not hard to find. (laughs) All right. I'm already in trouble. Let's just go ahead and say it. Some of these songs that say, you know, he's running after me, he's chasing. Why? No, no. God wants us running after him. Why is God running after us? Oh, the only reason God would run after us is if we've gotten out of our assignment. We need to run back to him. And when we run back to him, he's got his arms wide open. I'm ready to bless. I'm ready to anoint. I'm ready, amen, to pour out my spirit. I'm ready to pour out my favor on those that will seek after me. Somebody shout amen. Y'all don't understand what I'm saying today. Church, I'm trying to get us, I'm trying to pull us back into this place of prayer. I'm pulling myself back into this place of prayer. It's the only place. It's the only place where things are going to change. It's the only place where things are going to change. That's it. There's no no secret formula. Colonel Sanders does not have a secret formula for revival. Revival. There's no, there's no magic. There's no thing that's now been discovered by some, you know, ministry uh, group that now has this great idea of how to bring revival. God wrote it in this book from the beginning. He's not ever changed. And the way to revival is still to seek my faith face saith the Lord if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land I want America healed I said I want America healed I want America healed America is the last, the last nation on earth where I believe God is still moving. I know there's, there's revivals around the country, or around the world, but I believe America is a strategic tool in the hand of God during these last days. And I want America healed. I do. 
I am not giving in to the agenda. My wife shared a video with me this morning. Some big, I don't know, pride gathering. And there was this the guy being interviewed. And, and the interviewer was asking, had a sign, I guess, asking, you know, who he was. He said, I'm they. What do you mean by they? He said, well, I'm not he and I'm not she. I'm they. The interviewer said, who's they? He said, it's too complicated. Yeah, it is complicated. It's simple. You're either a he or a she. It's simple. You've made it complicated. Why have you made it so complicated? And so, so the guy simply asked him, he said, so what is your name? He said, my name is Legion for I am many. I am Le And he was right. Let me tell you something. I, I don't say that to be critical. I say that to awaken us to the fact if we don't begin to pray, this demonic agenda that is overtaking America is going to win. And I, as long as there's breath in my lungs, I will not let Legion, the devil, or hell win because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I'm standing on the fact that if my people pray, God is going to hear somebody shout amen. My God, my God. Hallelujah. Give God praise right now. Lord Jesus, we need you. God, we need you. We need you. He said, knock, and it will be opened. It, 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 it will be opened. Knock, it requires desire. It requires initiative. When you knock, you don't knock on a door unless you want to get into that room. But when I knock, it shows, hey, whoever's in that room, let me in. I want to be where you are. I believe the Lord is saying, if my people will just knock, I'm going to open the door to my presence. I'm going to open the door to my provision. I'm going to open the door to the next season of your life. Somebody in this room is stagnant. You are stuck, and you don't know where to go, and you feel like this is the entirety of your life. I'm telling you, the Lord is saying, if you will knock, I will open the door to the next season of your life. The next position of that season is going to be greater than the position you are in right now, and the things I have prepared for you are on the other side of the door but that door remains shut until you are willing to knock and knock until that door is opened unto you do you receive that word in Jesus name shout amen oh God you say pastor how can I, I tell you why I'm so passionate about this it's because I know this is the will of God I know it as sure as I am standing on this platform, I know it. You know why? Because that, go back to Matthew 7. Jesus said this. He said, what man is there of you that if his son asks for bread, are you going to give him a stone? If your son asks for a piece of fish, are you going to give him a scorpion? He said, okay, if you being evil, you being physical, know how to give good things good gifts to your children. How much more? Come on, say how much more. <laughs> oh, how much more is my heavenly father going to give good things to them that ask? Church, listen. It's not God's fault America's in the situation it's in right now. It's not God's fault my life is in the situation it is right now. It's not God's fault we're not seeing provision flow right now. It's simply because we have not asked, we have not sought, and we have not knocked. And I'm ready to start asking, I'm ready to start seeking, and I'm ready to start knocking. And I need a church that's going to stand with me and say, yes, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> 